Okay. So, are you ready to begin now, or do you want to wait another couple of minutes? Um, let's begin okay. and uh, see how it goes. Sure. And Josh, people can still join. The, the room doesn't get locked, does it? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, Wonderful. they're coming a bit late, but that's, I think that's okay. Yes, no, that's fine. So, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night sit. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tammy and I'm one of the volunteer facilitators for Melbourne Insight Meditation. And as you're aware, Melbourne Insight Meditation offers weekly sits every Monday and Wednesday night, as well as some online workshops and retreats. So just a reminder, these sits are silent. So just so that you can get the benefit um, out of this time, we just recommend you turn off all mobile phones and devices. And prior to beginning, be, to beginning and on behalf of Melbourne Insight, um, we traditionally begin with acknowledging the traditional owners of the country of the land on which we sit. And we recognize that sovereignty was never ceded and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And so tonight we're very fortunate to have Patrick with us as, one, as our teacher. And Patrick is a dedicated and senior Dharma teacher who has been practicing in the insight and Zen traditions for many decades and has been teaching full-time since the year 2000. Patrick is a very valued guest teacher at Melbourne Insight Meditation, and we are so appreciative of you giving of your time to be here with us tonight, Patrick. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I briefly outlined that there will be a Dharma talk first tonight, and then there will be a sit, which, um, Patrick, you, it's up to you if you want to guide it or not, but there'll be time at the, after the Dharma talk to have our sit. Mm -hmm. Before we get going, just a couple of announcements regarding the online retreats and offerings that are coming up, all, um, yeah, as I said, online. In um, October, 16th of October, Angela McGee and Carol Perry will be um, doing their annual retreat, um, Open Heart, Open Mind finding refuge and nourishment during difficult times. And the details for that are listed on our website. And Jess Hewan will be doing a one day online retreat on the 31st of October via Zoom. And the heading for that um, retreat is devotion. So if you want to know any more details, go to our website and they'll be there for you. Um, I'll say a little bit more about Dharma at the end, but as many of you are aware, in this tradition, the way we show our thanks to our teachers like Patrick is through the practice of Dharma. And Dharma is a deep heart and generosity practice that's intrinsic to the ancient Buddhist tradition. And it helps support teachers for the time taken to prepare and learn and present these teachings and pass down the wisdom of the Buddha. Patrick doesn't receive any payment from Melbourne Insight for his time. And so we strongly invite you all to participate in this heart and generosity practice. No amount is too big or too small. However, we encourage you to give something so that you too can also reap the benefits of practicing dana. It goes both ways. It's a reciprocal relationship and one of deep generosity. Um, Patrick's details are for payment are provided in the chat box and they're also on our website. And we encourage you to try to do this soon after the talk tonight because we know how busy people can get and if we don't do it in a timely fashion, it can often just slip out and we not meaning to, but we can forget to actually acknowledge um, and support our teachers. And a very, very big thank you as always to Josh tonight for your assistance on tech support. Um, it's always a very um, relieving to know that you're there and, and a wonderful support to us all. So thank you for that. And um, I'll hand over to you now, Patrick. 
Thank you, Tammy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this is part two of a um, long and complicated talk. Uh, first part was last week. This is to Vachagota about fire. <clears throat> so I hope um, you're familiar with, with last week's, but um, this is um, a dialogue between the Buddha and a Brahmin wanderer, Vachagota, or simply Vacha. Um, he was a, a, a seeker after truth and quite very intellectual. Uh, so he, his search for truth involved um, exploring the deep philosophical questions of his day and trying to get to some kind of definitive answer. And he comes to the Buddha one day with a series of these questions. There are 10 of them which we looked at last time, but they're basically questions about the universe, the nature of the universe, the relationship between life and the body and the survival of an awakened one after death. And we pointed out last week that all of these questions, and these are the big questions of his time, all of these questions revolve around identity. So what is, for example, what is the real nature of the universe? What is the real nature of the awakened one. So if you look at what Vacha is doing with these questions, he's searching for certainty. So he wants to understand what is really going on because he thinks if he can just get the answer to these fundamental questions, then he will be at peace. Now, the questions are about identity. And if you look at Vacha himself, we can see that the basis for his obsession with these questions is his sense of his own identity, his own place in the world. Um, now, he came from a wealthy family of Brahmins. He walked away and joined a heretical sect that rejected the Vedic orthodoxy. He's living as a beggar. Uh, basically, he's a dropout. He's a loser. Um, and he has to be able to justify to himself and to others his, his abandonment of his family and his career. And the only way he can do that is to find the answers to these questions. It's rather reminds us of the Buddha himself when he left, he walked out of his home in search of enlightenment. Think of how frustrating it was after many years of practice that he still had not cracked that problem. And think of what a loser he must have felt and how utterly wasted his life was unless he could get that answer. This is where Vacha is. I think it's one of the reasons why the Buddha took an interest in, in him. He might have looked at his younger self. Now, so Vacha is going to the Buddha and he wants answers to these questions. But the Buddha is refusing to engage with any of these questions. He just says, I don't have that view. That's not my view. Uh, because the Buddha's focus is not on theories and doctrines. That's not what, it, what he's interested in. He's interested in the felt actuality of our experience. And he's also interested in our determination to push aside actual experience in favor of holding on to abstract ideologies. And last week we talked about how when these two characters are discussing, you get the different uh, words that are used. It begins with diti, view. Vacha wants to know what's your view on this issue. Um, and then the, the discussion shifts to diti gata and ditta. Diti gata can be translated as conceptual view or conviction. Um, and this implies something abstract that's constructed out of it of an experience which is held on to. This is the truth. So this is diti gata or conceptual views, and the Buddha speaks of his ditta, which is an experiential view. So, um, for example, if you're using, let's say you're using breathing as 
meditation object. You're tracking the experience of your breathing. There's the inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation. This is dita. This is view. You've got a direct view of what's happening with your breathing. Let's say at the end of the sitting, someone says, how was that sitting? And you say, that sitting was complete rubbish. I can't do this. I've never been able to do this. I don't know why I'm even bothering to try. That is um, ditigata. That's conceptual view or conviction. But you notice that they're both views. But one of them is grounded on the actual immediate experience. The other is blah, 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 based on the actual direct experience. So the Buddha, in the last week, the Buddha was making this distinction clear. And he was talking about a state of liberation. Um, well, for, for saying, he was pointing out how when we live in our concepts, what we do is we create a fixed sense of identity of me and my world. And we do this in order to find certainty and stability. And we don't realize that it's our very clinging to these concepts and to the certainty and stability they're supposed to bring us that creates our pain and our insecurity. So, so he, and he speaks of a state of liberation where all these constructions of identity and possession are gone. And that's the liberated one. The awakened one liberated by not clinging. So this is all last week. But Vacha does not get it. He doesn't quite get this. Because he's so caught up in his sense of his own personal drama that he can't make the breakthrough to understand what the Buddha is talking about. So yeah, okay. So there's, this, this is... Vachari is saying, this is great. There's the liberation of the heart through not clinging. But who is the person who is liberated? So uh, the, the way Vacha asks this question is in the context of life after life or rebirth. Now, Vacha takes for granted this idea. Basically, you could say something happens next. Um, so it's natural for him to inquire, okay, the practitioner is liberated then what? What happens next? But the way he frames the question is in terms of the next life. This is natural in the, in the culture of the time. He says, when a practitioner's heart is liberated in this way, Master Gotama, where does he appear after death? And the Buddha replies, the term reappears does not apply. So, Again, the Buddha is kind of dancing away from answering this question. But Vacha goes on, and what he, he goes on with four questions where he's exhausting the four logical possibilities. Something either is or it isn't, or it both is and it isn't, or it neither is nor is not. So he says, then the awakened one does not reappear. Then he both reappears and does not reappear. Then he neither reappears nor does not reappear. Now, these four questions cover all conceptual, logical possibilities. Any answer to a question has got to be in there somewhere. Um, but in every case, the Buddha simply says, the term does not reappear, etc., etc. The term does not apply. Na upeti does not apply. Bang. So, now, what's going on with Vacha? Now, it's easy to dismiss him as some kind of fool. Like he's asking all these philosophical questions and the Buddha's laying out the teaching to him and he's not interested. But the question is very real. I mean, he's putting it in terms of rebirth. But even without rebirth, the question is real. Because if you think about what are we doing here when we practice, we're, each of us is looking for some kind of transformation. In other words, each of us is dissatisfied to some extent with who we are now. We want something different. We want to become someone different. Now, to the extent that we think about the goal of our practice, the destination of the path, 
how do we think about it? We think about it in terms of our own identity. What happens to me at the end of all this? So I want to be awakened, whatever that means. Then what would that look like? Who would be the awakened me? How would the awakened me live? What happens to the awakened me in the future? What will my friends think about the awakened me? Have you ever thought like that? Um, now, the problem with this kind of thinking is that it continues to use the conceptual view of identity in order to understand transformation. But this is precisely the view that we have to abandon in order to undergo transformation. It's the transformation that the Buddha is talking about. And this is why we actually don't really want to change. Because to, to change, to transform, we have to let go of everything that is familiar to us and plunge into something entirely unknown. And that's why in our practice, fear often arises and we find ourselves pulling back from the unknown to the familiar sense of who we are. And this is what Vacha is doing. So he's caught a vague glimpse of what the Buddha is talking about, but he's still trying to understand it conceptually. And that very attempt is smothering the arising of his insight. So when he asked his 10 questions before, the Buddha responded by rejecting the view that was on offer. So what do you think about the view that, you know, the world is, the universe is eternal? And for each question, the Buddha said, I don't have this view. So he's just chopping away that view. Now he's rejecting the very question itself. The question itself is wrong. It does not apply. Um, this um, always reminds me of a story about the Zen teacher and the philosophers, a friend of mine who's a, a Zen teacher. Uh, I don't know if he still does, but he used to gather weekly with um, these old retired academics and have learned a discussion about the mysteries of life. And sometimes I ask questions about Zen. And my friend, being a Zen teacher, would give kind of Zen-y answers. And this would cause frustration to the retired academics who had no idea what he was talking about. And one of them in frustration one day said, why can't you give me a straight answer to my questions? To which my friend said, you cannot give a straight answer to a crooked question. And the Buddha's doing the same thing. The question itself is crooked. There is no straight answer to it. Um, but Vacha is getting more and more confused. He says, I don't understand, Master Gotama. I'm confused. Now I have lost the clarity I gained from our previous conversation. Um, now at this point, the Buddha kind of eases off a bit and he, said, he explains, look, your confusion is perfectly reasonable under the circumstances, given that you come from a very different tradition and what you're trying to understand is very profound and very difficult to see. And then he gives them, gives him the fire metaphor. And this is at last where we come to the fire. So this dialogue is the key to the whole discourse. Uh, the Buddha says, what do you think, Vacha? If a fire was burning in front of you, would you know it? I would, Master Gotama. Now you can almost, you can feel Vacha's relief. It's like he's pounding the Buddha with all these philosophical, profound philosophical questions. The Buddha says, let me ask you a question. And Vacha must be thinking, oh my God, how am I going to handle this? But the question is kind of really basic, really straightforward. Okay, imagine there's a fire burning in front of you. Do you know that there's a fire burning in front of you? Well, duh. Of course I do. The next question, if somebody asked you, this fire burning in front of you, what does it depend on to burn? What would you answer? Ask that, Master Gotama, I would answer, 
This fire burning in front of me burns, depending on grass and sticks. If this fire in front of you goes out, would you know this fire in front of me has gone out? I would, Master Gotama. If somebody asked you, Vacha, when that fire in front of you goes out, where does it go? Does it go to the east, to the west, to the north, or to the south? What would you answer? And Vacha says, that does not apply, Master Gotama. The fire burned, depending on its fuel of grass and sticks. When that is used up, if it does not get any more fuel, in the absence of fuel, it is regarded as gone out. So too, Vacha, an awakened one has abandoned that body perception choices awareness and feeling by which one conceptualizing an awakened one conceptualizes him. So we're going to unpack this dialogue because this is really important. Um, we begin with the obvious. That fire in front of you, can you see it? That screen in front of you, can you see it? So the question and the answer are simple, clear, obvious. It's about what's happening right here, right now. Then the next question, what is it burning? Simple, clear, obvious. When it goes out, when the fire goes out, can you see that? And again, simple, clear, obvious, immediate. And then with the Buddha's next question, everything jams to a stop. When the fire goes out, where does it go? This question is completely different. The previous questions are all about immediate experience. This question takes an immediate experience and then kept conceptualizes it in a way that a metaphor, a fire, quote unquote, going out, is built upon it, upon the experience, and then it's treated, the metaphor is treated as if it continues to be the immediate experience. But it isn't. It's something completely different. Do you get the distinction? Any questions so far? Clear as mud. Now, this is the Buddha is taking us back to what he was talking about when he was distinguishing between experiential view and conceptual view. The experience we gave last week, experiential view, the experience of a rainy afternoon. Conceptual view, the experience of a rainy afternoon leads me to think about climate change and what we should do about it. Now, we would call both of these view. I see outside a rainy afternoon. My view on climate change and what we should do about it is dot, dot, dot. We use the same word, view, but they are completely different in their nature. Um, so the fire goes out. Where does the fire go? This question represents entry into the world of concept where concept is mistaken for felt experience. And this is the world where we normally live. We make this mistake again and again and again. And it's the basis for most of the decisions that we make about our lives. So we begin with our actual experience here and now. This is experiential view. And then we slide into networks of concepts about our actual experience. And this movement is so habitual and so subtle that we tend not to notice it. We think nothing has changed. But in fact, everything has changed. Now, in the dialogue, Vacha, now he gets it now. He understands that change. 
when the fire goes out, where does it go? And Vacha is struck by the absurdity of the question, and he says what the Buddha said to him, na upeti, it does not apply. The answer to this question, any answer to this question, misses what is actually happening. Any answer to this question sends us off in the wrong direction. Uh, what the Buddha is saying is that an awakened one and awakening itself cannot be captured by concepts. Um, so if you look at the question, for example, who am I? Which is a popular question. You notice how, notice how the question becomes, who do I think I am? And you notice how that's a different question? So, I am this body. That's a pretty obvious, right? This is me. You're looking at me. When you look at the image of my body, you're looking at me. Um, if I am my body, what happens to me when this experience of body falls away? and is replaced by another experience. Is this a new me? Uh, is it someone else? Is the old me lurking somewhere behind this experience? So for example, who am I? I am my body. So which body is that? Is it the slim active version of my youth? Or is it, is it the fat, worn-out version of my old age? Which one? Is it one of the ones in between? Well, so let's say I am my feelings. A feeling um, is another one that we tend to identify with. So if I am my feelings, which feeling is that? Is it the feeling that I like this pizza? Or is it the feeling that I don't like that TV show. Which one? Um, hence the words of the contem contemporary sage Leonard Cohen, I don't trust my inner feelings. Inner feelings come and go. So this is the world of conceptual view where we normally live and we normally put our reality in this world. But the more we ground ourselves in experiential view, the less we can believe that our conceptual view is presenting us with what is really going on. Now, how do we ground ourselves in experiential view? Through the meditation practice. That's what we're doing. Um, the more we are in the actual flow of experience, the less we can take the stories we tell up ourselves about ourselves to be true. We can't take them seriously anymore. Now these stories that are about myself that I tell to myself, these stories are not true any, any more than the fire has gone out to the West. Equally, these stories are not false any more than the fire has gone out to the east. The stories we tell ourselves are just stories. Now, to get a sense of what the Buddha is getting at here, we'll go to another concept that he uses quite frequently. Um, he uses the term nimitta. This is a Pali and Sanskrit word. It's a technical term that appears in different contexts. Uh, usually, nimitta is translated as sign. So a story is like a sign that points toward something else. So for example, this Wednesday night meeting, when it's not online, is normally held at the Buddhist Society of Victoria. So let's say I'm going to that meeting. I want to attend the meeting at the Buddhist Society of Victoria. 
Let's say I've never been there before. I take a taxi. I told the cab driver, take me to the Buddhist Society of Victoria. I'm heading down whatever street it is. And the taxi cab driver stops in front of a building. And in the front yard of this building, there's a big sign. And it says, um, Buddhist Society of Victoria. And I think, great, I've arrived. So I'm very happy. I get out of the cab. Maybe I'm clutching my meditation equipment. And then I stand right in front of that sign. And I look around and I think, it's a funny place to meditate. It's a bit exposed to the traffic, isn't it? And um, meeting's due to start soon, but then there's nobody else here. What's going on? And then I notice other people coming, but they walk right past me and they go inside. There's this building behind me. And they all walk into that. That's odd. They aren't going to the Buddhist Society of Victoria, obviously. Now, clearly, I've made a big mistake. And the mistake is that I think the sign that says Buddhist Society of Victoria is the Buddhist Society of Victoria. But it isn't. Because it points toward the Buddhist Society of Victoria. So whatever that sign is, it cannot be the Buddhist Society of Victoria. It cannot be because it's pointing toward the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Do you see that distinction? Now this does not mean that the sign is not useful. In fact, it's extremely useful. It's what convinced both me and the taxi cab driver that we had arrived at, arrived at the right place. And we had. Um, as long as I can recognize the difference between a concept and the lived reality, the sign can help me find what's going on. It can help me navigate toward what's going on. So this is a, a basic way that the Buddha talks about the role of concepts. Um, in a sense, all stories are false. Although, as we said, strictly speaking, to say they're false, to say the truth, both of them don't work. What, what works is that some stories are useful, while others are not useful. And some stories are more useful than other, other stories. So if you look at the Buddha's teaching, it's a story. The Buddha is telling us stories. Now, what he's telling us, the fundamental story that he's telling us is, first of all, that it's possible to live a flourishing life. And secondly, this is how you do it. Now, this is a, a useful story. It's much more useful than a story about how I am so hopeless that whatever I do will be useless and I'm doomed. Now again, that story is neither true nor false. It's just a story. But it's not very useful. It creates suffering. So some stories are more useful than others. They bring us closer to what the Buddha calls the cessation of suffering. In other words, a fully flourishing life. Um, and also some stories are closer to the felt reality of experience than others. None of them are the felt reality of experience, but some of them are closer to it than others. So, for example, I'm in some kind of confrontation and um, I'm, a, I'm getting very upset. Uh, the story, there's two possible stories I could tell myself about this situation. Um, one is, right now, I'm very upset, and so I better be careful of what I'm about to say. That's the story. That is probably closer to the felt flow of experience than the story, this person is my lifelong enemy, and I need to get my attack in first. 
So some stories are more useful than others, and some stories are closer to the reality than others. But all of them are just stories. Now, this whole discourse is about Nirvana. Um, and so the question becomes, where is Nirvana to be found? And this is essentially what the Buddha is talking to Vacha about. And the answer to that question is, Nirvana is found here, now, in the direct encounter with the world before we apply any meaning to it. And we practice that direct encounter when we met, do the meditation. That's what we're doing when we're doing the meditation. We're practicing that relationship, that encounter with the world. Um, we're learning to live in intimacy. Um, now, given that it can never be expressed through story, that is to say, it can never be captured through story, is there anything that we can say about it? This um, problem um, very much preoccupies the Zen tradition. So I've got a couple of Zen stories to finish with, um, just to give a sense of how one tradition deals with this problem. How do we express what's really going on? How do we express awakening? Let's start with case 55 of the Blue Cliff Record. This is Dao Wu's condolence call. Um, we have two characters um, in the story, um, Dao Wu, or we just call him Wu, and his student, Yuan. So Wu is a Zen teacher, Chan teacher. Yuan is his student. They come from the local monastery. And one of the parishioners of the monastery has died. So they've been invited to the funeral. And the, in, at the funeral in the house, the um, dead person is in a coffin. The coffin's in the main room. And people are coming and paying them their respects. So um, Wu and Yuan go to this funeral, uh, this uh, commemoration. Um, again, uh, Wu is the teacher, Yuan is the student. Yuan hit the coffin and said, alive or dead? Wu said, I won't say alive and I won't say dead. Yuan said, why won't you say? Wu said, I won't say, I won't say. So the first, this is the end of the first part of the dialogue. And they go, they continue their condolence call and then they leave. But Yuan is not satisfied. I mean, he's, he's a young man full of vigor and he's just not, he's not gonna let this alone. So halfway back to the monastery, uh, Yuan says to Wu, tell me right away, teacher. If you don't tell me, I'll hit you. Wu said, you may hit me, but I won't say. Yuan hit him. Beff. So Wu is on the ground. But he still won't say. Anyway, they get back to the monastery. Presumably Wu patches himself up. And time goes by. Eventually, Wu, being an old man, dies, and Yuan is off searching for another teacher. So the story continues. After Wu died, Yuan went to Shi Xuan and brought up this story. So Xuan is another teacher. Xuan said, and so um, Wu, uh, Yuan lays this whole thing out in front of him. Xuan said, I won't say alive, and I won't say dead. Yuan said, why won't you say? Chuang said, I won't say. I won't say. At these words, Yuan had insight. He got it.
Did you get it? <laughs> Would you like it like another one? <laughs> Which is equally obscure, <laughs> but totally clear, like this one. Uh, this also, there's um, two characters, the teacher and the student. This is in the context here, it's a, a, met, a Chun monastery. And that what they, the way they live, they each, um, twice a year they would do retreat, intensive retreat. Each retreat lasted three months. So a summer retreat and a winter retreat. So if you're a meditation monk or nun, you did three months intensive retreat, you had three months off, three months retreat, three months off, boom, boom, boom. And you could do this for years, for decades. And of course you could wander around from monastery to monastery and check out different monasteries and different teachers. Um, so in the intervals between retreats, the monks and the nuns would go off and they do other things. They travel or they study or they teach or they work at different projects. So our story opens at the end of one of these three month retreats where the teacher, Lohan, is saying goodbye to the monks, to his students as they leave. And he's keeping his eye out for one of them, Far Yen, because he knows he's on the edge of insight. This student just needs just a little push. So when Fa Yen approached, Lohan said, where are you going? Fa Yen said, I, I am on pilgrimage following the wind. Lohan said, what are you on pilgrimage for? Fa Yen said, I don't know. Lohan said, not knowing is most intimate. Fa Yen suddenly attained great awakening. Clear as mud. What Lohan is pointing out is that this is where Nirvana is found. This is, this is where awakening is found. This most intimate, not any story about this, just this here. And this is what we're practicing. Okay, that's it. Any questions before we do our meditation session? Josh, yeah, could you unmute? Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Hang on. Um, sorry, Patrick. I yep. just want to say thank you.